So, I'm so excited to have Chasta Hamilton of Stage Door Dance hanging out with us today. Um, you just published your first book, which is phenomenal. Um, I tore through it in like two hours, maybe not two hours, maybe like four hours. It was awesome. Um, what inspired you to write a book um, and, and, and about the competitive dance world? Yeah, so I, I love that I'm having this conversation with you because we worked together for so long and you kind of came in like right, <laughs> right at the right beginning. At the of, <laughs> you were there like for the evolution, yeah. um, which I love. And, um, you know, what, what really inspired me, I mean, I certainly didn't do it. And I was like, yes, I will write a book about this, but like getting three years outside of it and I would be speaking to people and they would say, there's no way I could ever take away that, that piece of my program. And I would be, I would say, yes, like you can. And they would have tears in their eyes because I could, I could feel the, um, the conflict that I had experienced, um, but like I could also just feel that like unwillingness to take the risk. So I was like, you know, you package it up in a story. Um, it's a very passive way to like hear that somebody did it um, because it's, it's something that can be really hard to talk about. And the book is set to the backdrop of like our extraction from the competitive dance industry. But more than that, and especially, you know, these last five months and even in my personal life, it's, it's truly a testament to just making sure that you're living a life that's true to yourself in any way, in any industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really interesting to see the evolution of the program. Um, I remember coming in like right at that tail end and being very impressed with the choreography and the coaching and everything, but there was just this tension in the room that sat in there like a, you know, like a bad smell. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> and what the kids were bad. You know? November 2013? <laughs> Uh, I think so. It, I Maybe. think so. Um, it, well, yeah, it was November, December 2013 because that's when I graduated. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a, it was a cool transition, though. Um, so, you, um, you had mentioned that, you know, you, you talked to people who were like, I can't remove that part of my program. Like, what specific things would you say to people about how – you know, how possible it is to remove that for your program. Well, I mean, I think right now more than ever, it's possible because everything is changing. You know, we didn't have a, a crisis of the world. We were kind of uniquely navigating through this when it was what everyone was, was doing. Mm -hmm. um, but right now everything is changing and it's a great opportunity to hit reset. I mean, obviously we're still strategizing in ways that I never even saw imaginable, but I'm not sure that I would have that opportunity for vision and creativity if I still had the weight of this third party industry. And I think right now more than ever, we have to focus on our own houses um, versus paying out just, you know, extreme amounts of money and revenue to people that we have no control over, but that directly impacts the valuation of our business. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, what was the straw that broke the camel's back as far as like, like, was there a moment where you were just like, nope, that's it, we're done, we're done with competition, we're never doing this again? <laughs> yeah, well, I think the straw that broke my back happened way sooner um, than my, you know, a lot of the people like within the studio. There was a lot of fear of, I was just like, I'm done. Um, but, you know, the leadership was kind of like, we need to, we need to, you know, sit on this. This is like a very extreme kind of um, reaction. Like, let's give it some time. Let's sit in it and let's figure out what, what would be on the other side. And I do, I do think that was good for us, um, especially since this decision came in the midst, you know, of a very normal time. Um, I think you can move fast right now. Um, but when we did this, you know, in, in 2014, 15, I think it was prudent that we took the time to really, really think it through. Um, and I mean, the, the, the thing that was the most frustrating to me is that the community component, which is what I think is one of the most important parts of the performing arts was deconstructing. And that's what I didn't, that's what I didn't like. And that's not what I wanted my legacy to represent. 
You did have some um, backfire from some of your staff when you decided to, to cut comps. How oh, I mean, back, backfire from everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were yeah. the numbers? I think you said you went from like 50 on your comp team to... I think like, it was 50, 55 to 13. Into ITP. That first year of ITP was something. <laughs> it, was, it was a boot, you know, it was a bootstrap year. Yeah. Um, and uh, honestly, like, we're all in bootstrap mode right now. So now is the perfect time to, to redesign and, and reset and have a more buy-in initially than, than we had. And, you know, even though those numbers were um, a, little, a little rocky, they, what did happen was that our overall enrollment did increase 25%. And now, even amidst this pandemic, our intensive training program is actually larger than our competition team ever was at the height of its success. So I, I do think that's a testament to what people are looking for um, so cool. in extracurricular design. Can you describe that, the intensive training program and how that's set up and, and what that means for your students? Yeah. So when we were kind of doing this brainstorm of how are we still going to offer elevated dance education experiences, because we never wanted that to kind of be out of the program. Um, we said, well, you know, what are going to be the four core values? And they were technique, performance, community, and character. And that's kind of what everything sits on top of in all of our programming, um, which, you know, has always been so important to me. And it's why you were such a great fit. Um, because I think we share that commonality that dance is for everyone and everyone can learn how to, you know, be a beautiful dancer or be more confident or be more capable through the power of the performing arts. And that's what we wanted to really soak into the intensive training program as well as to all of our students. But we wanted the intensive training program to be the ambassadors of that mission. And I mean, it took time to hash it out to, to figure out the exact evolution. And, uh, you know, I feel like we're around 2018 is kind of really when we were gaining that momentum of, okay, like we tapped into something, we're figuring it out. Um, and let's just continue to roll and elevate. But the thing is, you know, you can't just create something and let it stay stagnant. Like it's a constant, let's revisit, let's figure out what's working, what could be better. Um, and I think that's the challenge because it is so easy to just be a part of the machine. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, since your kids aren't doing competitions, what other kinds of performance opportunities do they have and what kind of like other things besides performance opportunities do you get them involved with? So, you know, on a, on a normal year where we perform. Um, <laughs> we, we perform in the community typically five to six times a semester. And, you know, basically that's just hitting the ground, emailing people ranging from the kids museum to like veterans hospital festivals, like just saying, Hey, um, we're a centerpiece of this community. And if there's an opportunity to perform, we're going to be there. So, you know, that's one way because, you know, I mean, one of the reasons that we do competition is to practice performance. So when we created this new iteration, we said, well, how can we practice performance? And, you know, we started doing it in these community events, which one is great for the kids, the same experience, um, but also making them more adaptable because it's not always a beautiful stage. It can be a variety of, um, of performance specs. And in addition to that, it also is great brand impressions, like right here within our community. Um, you're not marketing your brand when you're at a dance competition, or you really shouldn't be if you're taking a more ethical approach. So, um, you know, there's that piece of it as well, which is really good to the business. Um, and outside of that, you know, we have, we do an annual benefit show, which is produced by int the intensive training program. And, you know, that's something that has evolved too. Like we initially were realizing that the students were kind of just assuming this show was like a gift, like they would show up and they would perform and it was great, but they weren't necessarily doing a lot of back end work on the marketing side, the fundraising side. So, you know, this past season, we really honed in on how we could improve that um, by practicing elevator pitches, um, doing lobby engagement, also doing um, set fundraising amounts for each group routine so that they would have to raise a number in order for that group routine to be in the show. 
Mm-hmm. Granted, that show never happened, but <laughs> you raise a lot of money, though, show, didn't we? <laughs> we did. Like, I, yeah, all of those group routines had already met their dollar amount before the shutdown. And that show is going to be in May 2021. So we're just going to keep building. Um, but that's just an example of how we figured out ways to make things better in regards to that and just a more well-rounded experience for the participants. We also do workshops with guest artists or we'll take a trip to New York City or we'll do a parade in Washington, D.C. Um, another one of the things that I really love that we have kind of hashed out again, it, it wasn't perfect in its first year iteration last year, but it's on the right track now is the Leadership Lab Supplemental Component, which is an opportunity for ages 12 and up. And it is solely leadership, goal, executive functioning focused, because what we were realizing is we have so many things we want to cover to inspire our students um, that maybe we don't get to when we need to be doing choreography and rehearsal. Um, So this, this little session is so, it's so good right now and it's so needed. and I'm just, I'm really pleased at how that has, has evolved and developed too. I was really excited to see that added to the, um, to the list. I thought that was really cool. Um, what about your own personal time? One of the things that you talked about in your book was how you were sandwiching your work weekends into your work week. And it was just constant, constant from rehearsal to comp to rehearsal to comp. You do so much stuff now. I feel like you do more stuff now than you did when you were competing, but you have more time on your hands. So I, d- I did like in January. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> I don't We're right now. <laughs> Work life balance is, you know, but I mean, the only places I really go are studio and ho- I mean, there's not really the opportunity for a lot of additional stuff. Um, but, um, but you're right. Like when comp was out of the picture, you know, I was involved with more theater, um, I was able to help out, you know, with more volunteer organizations and also just do more storytelling for our brand and our business, which is really important as leaders that we're able to step out there and say who we are and what we represent. Um, And you can't do that. Like you just, you can't be that energetic when you're running a 40 hour weekend and hopping in for a full Monday through Saturday studio week. And it's even if you're juggling it and delegating, it's taxing. And I mean, I don't know, there's no industry and certainly no Fortune 500 company that operates that way. No, no, definitely. (laughs) Everybody (laughs) needs, everybody needs that, that balance, at least some, some, um, you know, shadow of that balance. Um, I know that teachers and parents, um, one of the number one things that they complain about, about as far as the competition industry is the lack of standardized rules and lack of enforcement of the rules that they print. Um, I don't know even what your perspective is as far as is the competition world even redeemable? Like, should we just completely boycott it? Like, wh- what are your what are your thoughts on that? And like, what would be like your ideal first steps as far as even touching the industry? So I used to judge for StarQuest and I, I do, I really respect a lot of the paths that they're on. And in July, Steve and I had a great conversation, their CEO about, about what would, like what could make it better. And, you know, the thing that we love is the simulation of a professional performance experience. So whether that's an audition environment, um, that maybe they set it up as it, because what's, what's happening right now is that it doesn't duplicate the professional working side of the industry. Like you never get to practice a routine for nine to 10 months and go into a Broadway audition and maybe get it. Like you have to learn it on the spot. So the things we have to hone in on in order to make it better are sequencing, adaptability, resilience. Um, and you know, I was throwing these wild ideas out, but I was like, what if, um, you had an opportunity to, to bring these groups in and they had to facilitate the entire thing from stage management to the technical pieces because so often as performers, and I see this in dance as well as theater, there's not an understanding of the work that goes into um, the tech side, sound, lights. That's so um, true. And, and it's complicated and we can't have one without the other. And I think that the more understanding performers can be about all of those pieces, the better off they become as a person. 
And um, so I said, maybe it could be like an escape room or something. I don't know. Like there's so many, there's so many ways it could go. It could also be um, maybe you come in and it's a group of a hundred and they learn an audition sequence. And then maybe 10 people have to show um, a 60 second improv piece to a piece of music that's selected like right there on the spot um, to work on their improv skills. And also, you know, what about maybe just a professional showcase where you say we're going to accept one group piece from each studio and let it be a celebration of creativity um, and creation because, you know, in this current iteration, we're losing creativity because it's all about duplication to win, which yeah. is, that's completely not what an art is about. That's actually um, another thing I was thinking about too was, was one of the things you mentioned in your book was how a lot of choreography was kind of duplicated over and over and there was a lot of tricks and flips and there was a lot of just, um, you know, people figured out like the formula that worked for those trophies. How has your choreography changed since you have stopped putting together these trophy centered pieces? Yeah, I, so I'm not sure I, I played the game well. Um, I, and I noticed this more as a judge, but I'm not sure that I, I compromised like on my end, um, in terms of most of our choreography, you know, like I think back to like, we did magic to do from Pippin, you know, one year with, with the props and, and was it like this amazing, like overall winning dance? No, but those kids learned so much from it. Like they learned Fosse style and, you know, just the importance of expression combined with simplified movement. And it's, it's a pay to play system. And I don't think I was necessarily a good player in the game. So I, I don't think that my choreography personally has changed a lot. But what I realized in the process when I started doing more theater was that this style, and as I was seeing my students having success in more theater from regional to tours to Broadway, was that, that what we were teaching is working. Like it's getting them where they need to go. And that was also another red flag of maybe this isn't, this isn't necessary. It's so expensive. It's unbelievably expensive. People, people get second jobs to support their kids dancing. I mean, that, that, that fact just blows my mind. I mean, the New York Times article that I found, you know, I pulled an article from the New York Times and I think it's referenced in the book, but it was saying that a lot of these families are spending fifteen to twenty five thousand a year. That's and a part time job. <laughs> and what weighs heavy on the studios is a lot of those parents think that we are profiting, you know, off of because we basically launder the money onto the third party. And I mean, if you have huge teams, it, there is the potential for profitization, but ours was never profitable, and in fact, operated at a loss most seasons. Um, so it's just. It's, it's a tough business proposition, like when you're really looking at how can I make my dance studio the best business possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another thing that you mentioned in the book is like the tricks and having to coach these kids with all these tricks that they're trying to do to get higher points. Obviously, since you're not involved in the comp world anymore, I mean, social media and the pressure of these kids to be able to do 27 pirouettes is still rampant. But how have you seen your students' technique improve or change since leaving the competitive? Well, I, th I think they're just stronger in general. Um, they have a better understanding of their anatomy. It's not so much let's skip the steps and, you know, and try to push this out. It's like, yes, like challenge yourselves, work to those, to those, you know, levels, work to that quadruple turn, but not until your double is clean and can be sustained as you're coming out of it. And understanding that you have to have a strong core and that your arms have to be supported from your spine and, you know, all of those little pieces, I think they understand the prog. And I talk about this a lot in the book, like the, um, the process over the product and they understand that the process gets them and that it continues, but that you can't just say, okay, product, um, without yeah. the process Boom, behind it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we used to have people come in all the time and say, I want an aerial. Well, there's, there's a lot of things that have to happen before you can achieve an aerial, especially safely. Um, and you know, safety, 
has always been like a big thing for me. Um, and I, it's just, it's not magic yeah. requires work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the downsides of the industry is because you only see the three and a half minutes that they spend on stage and you don't see all the, all the work that goes into it. And it can be very distracting. You know? It can. And you know, it, when people would see the skill on YouTube and they would come in and say, Oh, I want to do this. And it's like, well, did you stretch at home this week? Like, have you worked on you or are you so busy looking at everyone else and wanting to be them that you've neglected to focus on your personal work? Yeah. It's an, that's an easy trap to fall down. I mean, even for me and certainly, you know, the students and our teens, it's, it's hard to kind of delineate between, reality and digital yeah definitely um as far as i know we when, when we did cut that team we did lose you know a good number of families have any come back have um like how how, how has the program grown since or i guess how has the program grown as a result of not competing well, so several people have come back um, and, it, you know, there's just this, like you were saying, that ick, that like yucky feeling in the air doesn't really exist. It's more of just like, even if people step away to do something else, there's always an open door policy. And even students from that period of time, I would say 70 to 75% have come back in some capacity, whether that's to take a class or even to participate in Girls Geared for Greatness, which it's so great that that has brought, um, you know, people from that period, like, back into the space. Um, I think that's great. And the overall, you know, studio and brand has really honed in on who, it's it, who it is. And the numbers are reflective of that. Of course, right now we're in the middle of reconstruction and rebuilding. So, like everyone. Yeah. Um, but I, because I feel like because we know who we are and are confident in that and are, are willing to say this is a distraction to what we're doing, that's, that will help us get to the other side too. Mm -hmm. What about like um, relationships between students or relationships between siblings? I know that we've had a couple sets of siblings and um, even like relationships between parents and dancers. Have you seen that change from your perspective since, since cutting the comps? I've seen a lot of, of, of positive change, certainly, um, based on, you know, my kind of limited viewpoint of what happens within our building. But there is just like a general, everyone is more supportive. And it's, it's not just that they're more supportive, it's that it's, it's honest and it's organic. Because, you know, when we were competing, yes, people were supportive, but it felt contrived. Um, and, and now I feel like every student really wants the others around them to be the best that they possibly can because they understand that the strength of the team is the strength of everyone. And, you know, when we have anomalies or if there's a situation, um, you know, I mean, we, we have still had a couple of bullying things happen, but because we have such clearly defined values, it's it's very easy to say this does not align with who we are. And if this isn't corrected or changed, you know, unfortunately we're just not a program. That's a great fit for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those bad apples can um, <laughs> have an effect on the culture for sure. And I mean, nobody wants to lose students, right? Like that's, that's the most baffling thing is, as these hurdles arise and these challenges happen, I, I don't want to lose clients ever um, from a business perspective. Like you just, that's not smart. So when we have to have these, you know, heavier conversations, it's because they're so necessary and needed or they're going to impact the entire ecosystem, which could be more detrimental. Mm -hmm. um, so Donna had a question. What feedback have you gotten from the students and parents who have been with you both in competition and your new focus? Well, so those parents are some of our, like, most loyal people, um, and a lot of them gave me feedback, like, during the competitive process, or they would ask questions. Um, why is this this way? Why is this that way? And the, the questions were all so very valid that all I could say was, 
um, you know, unfortunately, I don't really know, or they would say, you know, you run a show and it's so smooth. And why is this happening with this? Um, because when we participated in these events, they also assume that you are validating um, the things that you choose to attend, even if they run in a way that doesn't reflect who you are as a person in a business. And I was like, those are really good questions. And I think um, the parents that have stayed with us are so appreciative to have someone that is confident. Um, I, it has made me certainly a better leader. And I mean, only because my leadership was failing so terribly um, at that one point because of all of this other noise and influence. Um, and I think now more than ever, like leadership, people are really looking for leaders, people that can talk confidently say like, this is what we're doing. And this is the direction that we're going in. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm so excited about um, just the growth that the, that the ITP program has, has taken over the years. I mean, like I said, coming in that tail end um, and, you know, just being in the room during some of those coaching sessions, I distinctly remember this one time you were so frustrated with, with the energy in the room. You were like, you guys here to dance or win trophies? And most, like, there was a good half and half. One of them was like, I, you know, I wanna, I'm here to dance. And then this one six-year-old was like, I want to win a trophy. I was like, <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it's true. I, I mean, I can't even, I mean, I can believe that I said that, but I don't remember. <laughs> that's you don't remember much of this, this year's. <laughs> but yeah, I was, I was probably like, I mean, that was the thing. Like, what was their mission? You know, yeah. I, I want these kids to be purposeful. Like, I want them to be leaders. And it's just like, you know, we don't get trophies every day for living life as a really to be good, productive humans. So what, what are, what are these kids learning? Um, I'm not sure it's the right things. Yeah. Well, and even the, the whole um, concept of like all the different tiers of awards and all the different levels and all the different, you know, special extra. I mean, it's not just first, second and third place anymore. Like I don't even know where to start as far as the leveling is concerned. So I really think that it, it plays into that whole participation trophy kind of, um, kind of thing, which, I mean, if our job as teachers is to educate children and, you know, as dance teachers to help them love and experience dance and enjoy it, then, this is not the route to do that. Like, I guess, where is the compromise? Like, what, what are you really trying to get out of this? And I feel like it's gone so far off, off the road. <laughs> like, I'm sure it started out great, but. It, yeah. And, you know, I was, I was a competitive dancer. Um, I can't tell you anything I scored. In fact, most of the time <laughs> I didn't even get a trophy because they only gave out like three. Um, and you just would go home and you would work harder and that was fine. Um, and usually, you know, my aunt would tell me that my spacing was off or that something could have been better. You know, it was, it was a very honest environment. And that honesty has been kind of replaced by this fear of, you know, hurting feelings. But as educators, if we can't be honest, um, what's our role? Yeah. Yeah. Are we really being honest with ourselves as, as teachers? What do you feel, I don't know if you even have an answer for this, but what do you feel was the turning point that took it from a valuable dance experience to something that is off kilter? Like what broke it? You, you know? know, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I necessarily know that exact answer, but I would, I think it was probably just profitization and um, the recognition of these can be really huge profitable events and we want everyone to stay happy and we want everyone to keep coming. Um, so then just like do showcases, like take the trophies away. And, you know, and that was another thing um, I was telling when I was talking to Steve, I was like, you know, partner up with, and, you know, I know Disney does this, but there are theme parks all around the country, like partner up with places where you can do more, um, showcases like yeah I get put these kids on stage anywhere huh. but we don't need to do it for a hundred and sixty dollars a solo um, I mean that oh, is that's a really that's a really high price for two to three minutes of time plus the choreography fees and the costume fees and the travel fees I mean it adds I mean it really adds up yeah that's just mind-blowing. I'm so glad that personally as a dancer, I was never involved. I remember um, 
in high school there was a there was a thing that went up on our uh, on our board at the studio and it was for like YAGP or something like that and my mom searched it and was like nope we do not have the cash for that and I am so glad that I was plucked out of that situation that's all I could say and, and, you know, I, a lot of times people are like, so what does this mean in terms of your like philosophy on competition? And I'm certainly not like anti-comp. Um, yeah. I think that you, we just have to make sure the comp, like, however we are teaching our students to pursue competitive opportunities, it has to be really meaningful. Uh -huh. Okay. So here's a great question. One of the most valuable things I gained from um, competing was to be able to see other dances from other studios, see what they were doing to motivate myself. How do you recreate that side when you're performing locally or with just your dancers? How do you collaborate? Like, how do you find that artistic collaboration? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I think a big piece of that is encouraging more performance viewing. Um, because I was also realizing that so many of our students had never seen a ballet or maybe had never been to a live theatrical performance. Um, and, you know, what a great way to enchant them and to also kind of see um, professional goals, as well as um, just this realization of like the hard work that it takes to get there. And I mean, we started out very small, you know, this is happening locally. Like, I mean, Haley, I think you took some kids to the ballet or as, have encouraged it certainly at, at different points. And, you know, that, that kind of piece of the culture has grown to where when we were in New York city last January, we had 80 some people at wicked. Um, they were obsessed and, with it too. They wouldn't stop saying oh, it. it was great. They still are. <laughs> They're still obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> And it's just, it's amazing because I think that theater is so important because not only does it show um, dance and performance kind of woven into something at like a, pro at a professional level, but I think our students also gain so much empathy and understanding about the power of storytelling. And that helps them as performers as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I do think they all still watch like YouTube videos, you know, all of that didn't exist when I was dancing. Um, so I think their accessibility to other performers and inspiration is certainly much more readily available now than it ever has been. And we do also like sometimes bring in, you know, you had mentioned this earlier, sometimes we bring in guest artists, we do master classes and um, I know over the summer, some of our advanced dancers go and take summer intensives at different places. So I mean, they do still get that versatility and that collaboration with other people. Um, and it, like, you know, yearly in typical years, we always go to the, um, the University of North Carolina School for the Arts Festival of Dance, um, which is great. It's, it's like $150, I think, for three days of classes. Awesome. And it's an unbelievable deal. Um, they're there with, you know, hundreds of other kids and take, taking with great guests. Um, and that's just like a really great opportunity that we have in our area. And it was the last weekend of February this past year. And I, it teaches the students also have to independently navigate the weekend. It's very kind of teacher removed, which is great because organization, schedule management, getting to where you need to go on time. Those are all things that I want our students to have to practice regularly. Yeah, that little preview of adulthood and managing their own time. And that's great, too, because it's it's such a great replacement of, like, conventions with, you know, dancing on the carpet and those sprung floors. Now with, you're like 800 good studios. people. Yeah, and you're in good studios with amazing teachers. I mean, UNCSA is one of the top school, dance schools in the nation. I mean. And, you know, every other year we go to New York where we rent space at Ripley Greer and I bring in friends to teach the kids. So there's eight to 12 kids usually in a studio. So they're taking classes with amazing people in an environment that simulates a dance studio because I, you know, I love going to Broadway Dance Center and taking class. And what I never learned, I never learned well in an 800 person convention environment with like people kicking your face. <laughs> It's just, it's hard. And somebody said, what do you think about conventions? And it's like, they're fun and they're flashy, but is it the best learning environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think um, to wrap up and summarize, I think um, you've done an excellent job in your book and today in our conversation of kind of just highlighting some of the discrepancies and 
um, providing a really awesome alternative to grow your program and grow your students and grow your school and grow your dancers. And I love it and I'm really excited to be a part of Stage Door Dance and I love working for you and I loved your book and I hope everybody reads it. So <laughs> thank you all so is there much. anything else that you wanted to say before we hop off? Um, you know, just this is, I, I really just want the book to be a conversation starter. It's just thinking about how things can possibly be a little different from maybe how they've traditionally been. And I think that's something that's weighing on all of our minds right now. I mean, it's still weighing on my mind. <clears throat> um, and it, you know, it's set to the backdrop of this kind of extraction from the competitive dance industry, but I think it is, is really kind of universally applicable. So I just, I really appreciate the support and I love hearing from people and I'm grateful um, that we had this time. Haley, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. And um, thank you for everybody who hopped on and for all your questions. Um, you guys can get in touch with Chasta over Facebook, Instagram. She's pretty easy to find. Um, pretty it's unique name. Door Dance Productions. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, and I will say if you, if you did have a chance to read the book and you enjoyed it, I hate saying this stuff. Um, but I'm trying to get better about it. Um, my publisher would really love for you <laughs> to drop an Amazon review. Um, but I, I hate putting those plugs in, but apparently it is part of the publishing industry and I would it appreciate it difference. so greatly. Um, it does so make just a thank big you. Difference. <laughs> well, thanks again. And I will hopefully see you as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll see you Saturday. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye everyone. Have see a great later. day. Bye.